Hi everybody, uh, I'm Girl Writes What, and uh, someone commented on one of my blog posts recently uh, asking if I could kindly try to do an entirely positive essay on feminism and uh, keep it handy for those who consistently misinterpret me. Uh, he wanted me to do that because his wife had walked in uh, on him in the middle of him watching one of my videos and she became so angry, uh, extremely angry, and would refuse to look at any of my other material, uh, not even to provide some kind of context for what I had been saying when she walked in. Um, she considers herself a feminist. Uh, she's not that political, but she has experienced a lot of angry people using the word feminist as an abusive epithet toward her for expressing egalitarian points of view. Uh, he claims she's the soul of decency when it comes to gender equality, and she just can't stand sexism against men. He went on to say, but she's always believed that patriarchy was fundamentally based on the oppression of women and that it is feminism that works to defeat that. I think because it's so rare for anybody to point out that this is a highly questionable point of view. Now, I opted not to accept his challenge, partly because he went on to say, quote, Let's face it, in our part of the world, the overwhelming message of media and academia is all about female oppression throughout history and women overcoming and empowering themselves in the face of sexist oppression. I mean, I don't need to explain that, right? It's everywhere. And perfectly sensible, intelligent, liberal-minded people cannot be blamed for thinking feminism is fundamentally about justice. So, in other words, he wanted me to find some victory of feminism that wasn't tainted in some way by uh, female demand for entitlement uh, without obligation, or the vilification of masculinity or blame of males. And as much as I racked my brain, I, I just couldn't even find any such feminist victory. Um, not even women's suffrage was free of the brand of female entitlement that seems to inform feminist theory. You know, at a time when men were paying in their millions on battlefields for the right they had only just won for themselves, women were there demanding that same right without a similar obligation to go with it. More than that, the entire premise of feminism seems to be that men had power and women had none that women were uniquely subjugated by gender roles in their top-down enforcement, while men had uh, benefit, uh, uniform benefit for all men uh, that came from running the system. And when you begin with a faulty picture of the world and everybody's place in it, uh, that kind of uh, skewed view trickles down uh, through every single advocacy effort you make which is why you had women demanding suffrage without any corresponding demand to purchase it the way men had, uh, through a costly obligation to their country. Something for nothing, just for asking. And the relative ease with which women have received uh, that and all the other benefits that they have received, um, it really set the tone for the ensuing century of female demand and society's hasty social and legal capitulation. And not just that, um, even setting aside the impossibility of finding some completely uh, pure and laudable effort on the part of feminists, uh, engaging in that kind of exercise just so I can fit my own advocacy efforts into a zeitgeist that's palatable to the very people whose distorted worldview I'm trying to change. That's kind of like asking a paleontologist to find something good and valid in creationism, or asking a mathematician to concede for the sake of peace and consensus that yes, maybe just sometimes 2 plus 2 can equal 7. You know, when you believe somebody is wrong about something, indulging their misperception is really, I feel, a dishonor that you have committed against them. So instead of doing what my esteemed commenter asked me to do, I am going to attempt instead to explain, uh, for the benefit of his wife, why I am in favor of gender equality, 
but refuse to call myself a feminist and why I believe feminist theory is inherently kind of screwy. Now, here's what feminist theory tells us about men. Men had all the power all through history. Men arranged society in such a way as to benefit men at the expense of women. Men purposely kept women from positions of public sphere of power for men's own benefit. Male authority in families was a cookie they got just for having a penis. Feminist theory tells us that because men were given this authority, the ones who exercised it equitably and fairly were probably the exception, and the wife-battering brutes were probably the rule. It tells us that marriage was female oppression and slavery. It tells us that because men had all the power in the public sphere, uh, and all of the legal authority in the private sphere, that every single injustice, great or small, all through history, can be laid solely at the door of men. And what does all this feminist theory tell us about women? Women have had hundreds of thousands of years since we made the leap from hominid to human, and they're only scraping themselves off the bottoms of men's boots now, just in the last second century, in a history spattered with the blood of dictators and dotted with the charred ruins of oppressive regimes overthrown at, by the downtrodden and the oppressed, it is women alone who have been consistently incapable of liberating themselves from their 100,000-year oppressors until a virtual eye blink ago. If there was ever a more convincing argument with respect to the innate inferiority of women. I have yet to see it. And it's a good thing that unlike feminists, I don't believe that. Viewing women's changing place in society strictly through the lens of feminist advocacy on the political and social front is also really dishonest at its heart. Uh, yeah, we've had feminist organizations agitating like mad for the better part of a century, often in areas where women were or already are ahead of men. Uh, but viewing something like, say, women's influx into the paid workforce as a result of only that advocacy is essentially thinking in a teeny tiny little vacuum. There were a ton of other factors that made a larger impact on women's ability and their willingness to change their roles. Safe streets, safe and comfortable transportation, automation, and the transition from a resource and manufacturing-based economy to one with strong tertiary and quaternary sectors. All of that made the public sphere, sphere workforce a place women would find fulfilling rather than onerous. And, strangely enough, most of those innovations have been brought to society by uh, <clears throat> men. Then there's things like medical technologies that resulted in lower infant and child mortality rates, longer life expectancies, and reduced women's extreme risks during pregnancy and childbirth. That also contributed to the liberation of women. Whereas my great-grandmother had to have six children just to ensure that at least a couple of them would survive to adulthood. Three of them did. Um, those kinds of measures aren't really necessary anymore. Later on, the pill and access to safe abortion technology freed women from the consequences of unwanted pregnancies as well, relieving the biological burden on them even further. Strangely enough, yet again, most of these technologies and innovations were brought to us by uh, men. And even more odd, though the pill was developed by male researchers, it's men who are still waiting 50 years later for a contraception that would free them from the legally enforced financial burdens of unwanted parenthood. Legal innovations enacted by, you guessed it, mostly men. So what were feminists saying about men in patriarchal systems always acting in men's interests and for men's benefit at the expense of women? Even with all that, I can't imagine women would have flooded the paid workforce uh, the way they have if the level of technology in the home had remained what it was in my grandmother's time. But surprise of surprises, the mostly men that comprised research and development 
through the 19th and 20th centuries brought us things like hot and cold running water, flushing toilets, ex extensive networks of water mains, gas lines, sewers, and electrical grids, washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, microwave ovens, deep freezes, mix masters, TV dinners, toaster ovens, canned foods, disposable diapers, and baby formula. All of which turned keeping a house and caring for and feeding a family a part-time job rather than a strenuous 12-hour-per-day ordeal. Those horrible, oppressive men, bastards one and all, never doing anything for women's benefit. The claim that men have always operated with the motivation of keeping women down for men's benefit is absurd when you look at the big picture. Hell, it was 100% men who ratified the 19th Amendment, and they didn't do it until a greater percentage of women demanded, rather than opposed, women's suffrage. Some of the loudest and most vehement anti-suffragettes were women themselves. Women who didn't want to be burdened with having to bother about politics, women who didn't care, and women who worried that the right to vote might obligate them to a form of public service comparable to conscription. It was only when female opposition to suffrage was overwhelmed by female support for it that the men in power went ahead with it. The entire thing was an exercise in powerful men giving women what they wanted. And when you consider how there were efforts for decades on the part of men in power, even after universal male suffrage, to limit men's right to vote by economic class, race, and educational status, while no such measures were ever attempted with respect to female suffrage. Well, it kind of looks to me like acting to the benefit of all men has never really been a priority for men in power, while giving women what women say they want and need very much is. So honestly, in my opinion, the social changes of the last century were the inevitable consequence of the changing nature of the environment we all live in though it might have been a more gradual transition had feminists not been yelling and screaming and giving it an extra push. When it comes to safety and comfort on the job, the modern day office is essentially no different than the living room in the, of the 1950s. It's about a hundred times better than a dirt floored cottage in the Middle Ages, and probably a billion times better than the conditions men were expected to labor under through most of history. And if what I'm saying here isn't valid, then why haven't we seen any influx of women into fields of work that resemble what men mostly did through history? Fields like rig pigging or tree falling or deep sea fishing off Alaska, despite the high financial rewards involved, the way we have with, say, veterinary medicine. In fact, because women now vastly outnumber men in that field, the specific area of veterinary medicine dealing with large animals and livestock is currently suffering a labor shortage. Maybe because that area involves a lot of strenuous, physically risky outdoor work. You know, men may have been willing to do that kind of work all through history, but women, even ones practically oozing with girl power, yeah, not so much. I once asked a feminist if she'd have chosen her great-great-great-great-grandfather's job working 12 to 14 hour days in an unautomated steel mill in 1800 over being stuck at home and financially dependent on him. To be the one to cut acres of hay by hand from sunup to sundown rather than the one back at the house tending the kids and uh, feeding the hens and wringing out the laundry with chapped hands. She said it would have been a tough choice. Really. I don't think it would have been tough for her to decide at all. I'm of the opinion that it would have been a physical impossibility for her to have even performed a huge percentage of the tasks men were set to back in the day. Feminists who point to women shoveling coal onto lorries during the Industrial Revolution never seem to realize that yes, though those women were working really, really hard, shoveling coal onto a lorry was considered light duty compared to what many men did for a living back then. And they never seem to realize that by casting those women as victims of the oppressive conditions of their participation in paid labor, they're kind of being hypocritical. Because as hard as women had it in the paid workforce back then, as hard as the work they did was, it was nowhere near 
as hard as how the majority of men had it. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say women were oppressed by being barred from getting to do everything men did, and then say they were oppressed when they got to do it. The majority of men, up until very recently, were stuck in labor that was joyless, or dangerous, or stressful, or exhausting. And they were legally and socially obligated to share the surplus fruits of their labors with women and children. What possible reward do feminists think uh, would be sufficient to trick men into donning that kind of yoke until death? Maybe the reward of being the head of their household? And while even the earliest feminists, a group almost entirely comprised of bored middle and upper class privileged white women, were looking around at the men in their social milieu and asking, why can't I be a barrister like my father? The other 95% of women were too busy getting by and too wise by far to wonder, why can't I work seven days in a week, a week in a coal mine or be conscripted into the military like my husband? My own grandmother was a career woman who juggled work and family and never sat down. And she wouldn't in a million years have traded her longer work days for my grandfather's job paving roads in 1935. Oddly enough, she outlived him by 28 years. In order to protect all women from the obligation to support themselves and their children during a time when that obligation would have caused extreme hardship to them, society had to keep men obligated to perform strenuous, dangerous labor and share that labor with women. And how could they do that without reserving the marrying wage jobs for the people who had the obligation to earn a marrying wage? And yeah, that probably really sucked for the 2% of women who might have gotten to be a barrister or a clerk. You know, the women who became the earliest feminists. But for the 98% who would have found themselves laying railroad ties with babies strapped to their breasts, the maintenance of that male obligation was really fucking important, and it couldn't have been done without rewarding men for it. The economic and political transition of the Industrial Revolution that saw both women and children grossly exploited in textile mills and factories before legal and social policy caught up to the changes in the economy, well, I'm almost positive all of those women would have been objectively better off and happier if they'd had the luxury of being stay-at-home moms dependent on their husbands. In fact, it was largely, if not entirely, the plight of working women in that era that was the primary factor in the institution of labor regulations and safety standards in the workplace. When it was only men losing hands or being crushed by steel beams, no one particularly cared. And they still don't particularly care. And I find it really interesting to note that even during the Industrial Revolution, when women's health and safety were essentially placed at a double risk through workforce participation and reproduction, they still managed to outlive men. If women hadn't been protected and provided for all through history, if they'd been treated as the disposable utilities that men were, masculinity being preferred in some ways because society needed meat for the grinder, I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be seven billion of us tripping over each other right now. And the very idea that women were oppressed by their exemption from the social, political, and economic machinery that prematurely claimed the health and lives of millions of men, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to call bullshit. And the notion that these norms unjustly privileged men as a group. Are you kidding? But here's where feminism defines power in a really particular way, through a political and economic lens uh, that's actually half covered in Vaseline. It's a lens that can only see male power and can't conceive of the existence of female power. By conveniently ignoring things like biological, emotional, and evolutionary power, feminist theory has been able to place men on top even when the vast majority of them are on the bottom. 
Things like life expectancy, health, reproductive agency. None of that really matters to feminists, at least insofar as how these issues have ever affected men. But these are all areas where women were and are objectively better off than men. All the way through. While nearly every female human who lived to adulthood managed to pass on her genes, only half as many men did. Uh, women have always lived longer than men because society had more concern for their safety and well-being. And from the time researchers began measuring happiness until the 1970s, women were consistently at least twice as satisfied with their lives as men were. Imagine a truly oppressed class living longer, happier lives than their oppressors. When the fuck has that ever happened? Yet because of the way feminism measures power, in their jargon, a woman who was bored at home and dependent on her husband in the 1960s was oppressed. While the 10 million men who died in World War I, or the countless millions through history who stood between their families and the dangers of the wild, or the thousands upon thousands who risked life and limb on oil derricks or in coal mines so their wives could do lighter duty closer to home and hearth and children, that's patriarchy hurts men too. That Japanese man who worked 70-hour weeks and died at his desk in his early 40s, he was more powerful than the widow who'd done light housekeeping and childcare and inherited all his money. The 80% of consumer spending dictated by women and the 70% market share they command on personal items sold, that's not power. Not according to feminists. No, according to feminists, it's the longer hours, less fulfilling and more dangerous positions, uh, less convenient shifts, and, and greater risk that men still work, which net them higher earnings than women. That's what power is to them. To feminists, women were in the support role through history, forced to clean his house and bear and raise his kids, never hers in that context, so that he was free to generate income. Free to generate income. Now, if the point of generating income within a marriage is to provide for children, then wasn't it men who were in the support role? I mean, they even call it supporting your wife and kids, for fuck's sake. Feminism believes women were relegated to their place because they were rendered powerless by male authority. The woman stuck at home with the children was oppressed by the system, Yet somehow the man who dragged his ass out of bed every morning to cut hay with a scythe for 16 straight hours without benefit or bug, of bug spray or sunscreen in order to provide for his family. That guy, he had privilege. And according to them, he wasn't doing it because this was a condition his wife placed on his genetic survival. I mean, women didn't have any power ever, right? But because it was an avenue to economic and political power, even though less than 1% of men ever had any kind of access to those particular rewards. Nope. To feminists, marriage was a one-way street of oppression, don't you know? He performed that labor because, I guess, because it was fun, and she didn't do it because he forced her not to. Not because she was incapable of it, or because it would be too fucking much to ask of her before technology made it possible for men and women to realistically swap roles. In typical denial of anything re resembling science, feminists have never once considered how dependent men were on women's reproductive capability when it came to passing on copies of genes, which is kind of the entire point of being a living organism, if any of you guys were wondering, and how that utter dependence has actually left twice as many men as women in the evolutionary trash heap. And they certainly haven't bothered to consider that because twice as many women have managed to pass on their genes, women have had twice the power over millennia to shape the inherent traits of males than men had to shape the traits common to women. The vast majority of men throughout history have been exactly what women chose and needed them to be. And when women finally, through technology and modernity, almost entirely provided through the labor and chivalrous consideration of men, had the freedom to change their roles. What did men do? They stepped back and let them. They made room. They enacted legislation to make it easier for them, and overhauled the entire system to suit them. 
Everything from more rigorous safety standards to sexual harassment regulations to changing teaching methods in school to better suit girls. And yet somehow, feminism's central premise is centered on a recurring theme as relates to women, to children, to society, all of it. Men are the problem. And how have we been convinced that men are and have always been the entire problem? Because masculine power is overt. It's noticeable. It's always had to be because men sought power largely in order to be noticed by women. And because men's power is noticeable, well, people noticed it. And because people noticed it, men have always been held to account for it. And women's power all through history uh, was by proxy. It was covert, and as such imbued with plausible deniability. The Spartan woman who told her husband to come back with his shield or on it bore no responsibility for the deaths he and he alone caused. All she did was make a demand. He had all the real power because he was the one with the last name and the sword. And when he shared with her the spoils he'd taken, none of the blood was on her hands, was it? It's not like she'd stripped that gold from the bodies of the slain. It was all him. She just told him to do it, made it a condition of her continued love and respect, and benefited from the result. It had nothing to do with her. Female power was the power of complaint and manipulation, the power of emotional appeal, the power to scream and have men come running, the power to dictate what is and isn't a man, and the power of female infantilization and victimology that triggers the instincts of men to provide for and protect women, even if it means throwing other men, or even themselves, under the bus. It's the power a white feather girl had to drive a 15-year-old boy to re-enlist in the Great War, you know, the one that killed 10 million men, two weeks after he'd been sent home from the horrors of the trenches for being underage. It's this same power that feminists have used to convince an entire nation that the government refusing to force employers to pay for women's contraception is a war on women, even while it was feminists who protested the development of a male contraceptive at the World Population Conference in Budapest, and even while the bulk of sex-specific health funding, public and private, research and care, and even excluding everything related to reproduction, goes toward women's health. It is the power that allowed Sandra Fluke to bravely rattle her saber in front of the Senate and then throw it down and cast herself, and by extension all women, as a victim uh, of a vicious and brutal attack because some fat guy on the radio called her a slut. It's the power of manipulation that allows feminists to claim that patriarchy, a system that considered childbearing and childcare so important that the only people who were capable of it should be kept at that work whenever possible, and that individual men should support women in that work through the blood and sweat of their own labor. That this was the system that devalued motherhood. And they somehow managed to convince us of that, all while telling women that having babies was wasting their lives. It's this power of manipulation and plausible deniability that allows feminists to insist that not only is default mother custody after divorce the norm because of patriarchy, when it was actually the result of early feminist activism, but that it actually harms women more than it does men. Blame the patriarchy. Blame the men. It's everyone else's fault, even when it isn't. Even when it's exactly what you asked for. And the projection of female psychology onto men that informs all of patriarchy theory is just astounding, as is the gall of feminist women who make no bones about telling men how men really feel, uh, why they really behave the way they do, and what it's really like to be a man, while simultaneously criticizing men for mansplaining and telling them they couldn't possibly know what it's like to be a woman. And when I consider that one incredibly important gender difference in psychology, women's mechanism for automatic own group preference and men's utter lack of it, 
it's obvious to me uh, what feminist theorists were thinking when they constructed the patriarchy and all its flawed secondary theories like rape culture and patriarchal terrorism. They were thinking, well, if I was in power, I'd be totally helping, protecting, and supporting my own gender and screwing over the other. So that must be what men have been doing all this time. Their failure to see how men, in power or in general, have displayed a historical tendency to throw other men under the bus to provide help, support, and protection for women is just mind-boggling. While it was feminists who devised the predominant aggressor policy, it was mostly men in power who signed it into law. While it was feminists who devised rape shield protections and the guidelines in the Dear Colleague letter of last year, it was mostly men in power who gave them the go-ahead to do it. How the hell does any of that factor into some woo-woo theory that men privilege other men at women's expense? When I read Christina Hoff Summers' article, No Country for Burly Men, and discovered how easy it was for feminist groups to demand a sit-down with Obama, and commandeer a disproportionate share of the stimulus money for female sectors that had actually gained jobs during the recession. That's when I understood how much power women have in society, even when men are nominally in charge. And the awesome thing for feminists and for women is they don't have to take responsibility or blame for any of it. Feminists will blatantly disavow the power women have always had to manipulate men and enforce masculinity. You know, the power that made that 15-year-old boy re-enlist in the army because a girl he'd never met handed him a white feather and called him a coward. All while claiming the male gaze is so powerful it destroys women's self-identities and is the primary cause of eating disorders and rape. They'll completely dismiss the idea that women had an enormous amount of power over what was considered a man through the entirety of human history, all while employing the exact same manipulative tactics as their ancestors did, decrying MRAs, you know, men who dare to prioritize men's problems rather than women's, as angry, bitter, micropeened, neckbeard losers who live in their mother's basements and can't get laid. The hell is that, other than, I get to say who's a man and who isn't. And all a feminist has to do is claim that MRAs have said some mean, angry, and critical things about feminism, and all of a sudden, there's the SPLC riding to the rescue with an expose on the dangerous misogyny and hate-mongering in a non-violent human rights-based movement. And those powerful, powerful men in the MRM you know, the ones society unjustly privileges and benefits just because they're men? They can't even get the men in charge of the SPLC to address the genocidal mania of the feminists at Radical Hub. And women don't have to acknowledge any of this power. They're the whispering voice in the ear, not the finger that pushes the buttons. That ability to disavow all those forms of female power that helped sh shape society and history, well, that's probably the greatest power they have. The plausible deniability inherent in female power has allowed women to completely duck any responsibility for how the system used to work or for their part in maintaining and enforcing it. It's how feminists can claim that while the vast majority of women benefited from that system, it actually oppressed them, well, even though men were frequently chewed up and spit out by this same system, it conveyed unjust and undeserved privilege on every single one of them. Men had all the power, even when they didn't, and women had no power at all, even when they were pulling the strings. And while feminism fights for ever more overt political and economic power for women, they continue to cast men alone as the villains of history, cast women as their perpetual victims, ignore all the ways men have deprioritized their own needs and well-being for women's benefit, as well as all the ways women demanded that, they distance themselves from all the ways feminism has damaged society, cling to women's patriarchal benefits with a kung fu grip G.I. Joe would envy, 
and walk away smelling like a rose because, hey, women had nothing to do with it. They're powerless, don't you know? Anyhow, that's probably not all I have to say on why I am not a feminist, but I hope that it clarifies some of the reasons I'm not. Um, I think feminism's view of history gives women absolutely no credit, uh, because you can't have credit if you're never held accountable for anything. And uh, I guess that's it. I guess I will see you guys all later.